So you're seeing my screen, right? Yes. Are we live, Tanya? Yes, we are. Let's just wait for the participants to log in. Welcome everyone to the first in a series of webinars focusing on opportunities for Arizona companies to export their products and services to Mexico. I'm Kevin O'Shea. I'm Senior Vice President for International Trade at the Arizona Commerce Authority. We're delighted to have you here with us this morning. This webinar today focuses on concrete opportunities that exist right now for Arizona companies to sell into and to fill gaps in key industry manufacturing supply chains in Mexico. You will also hear today about resources and programs that the Arizona Commerce Authority has, which will help you seize these opportunities and export to or grow your already existing exports to Mexico. These programs and resources are easy to use and highly impactful. I would like to introduce Juan Siscomani. Juan is Senior Advisor for Regional and International Affairs in the Office of Arizona Governor Doug Ducey. Juan also serves as the Vice Chair of the Arizona-Mexico Commission, which is a partner with the Arizona Commerce Authority and a co-sponsor of this webinar today. Juan will speak about the importance of the Arizona-Mexico trade relationship and the export imperative for Arizona as we rebound from the COVID-19 situation. Thank you very much, Juan. Thank you, Kevin. And um, hello to everyone. Thank you for joining today's very important webinar. Uh, this conversation is a, is a very key conversation to be having right at this moment. The trade between Arizona and Mexico has been um, really just a, a pillar of Arizona's economy for a long time. It certainly was that way in 2019 as we had a record breaking year and it will also continue to be as we bounce back and reopen safely and we reopen stronger, stronger than before. The relationship with Mexico or trade relationship and the opportunities that this regional strength will bring to the state's economy will be essential and key as we, as we bounce back. So I wanna give a few highlights of the Arizona Mexico Commission and, and what we do and, and why it matters and why and how this positions us into um, a very uh, privileged uh, position to really take on these challenges of international trade as we move forward. No secret that Mexico is Arizona's number one trading partner times four, Canada's number two with about a fourth of that trade, and then China follows. <clears throat> so definitely our North American partners are on top of our list and that's the way it's, it's been, and that's the way we, we wanna continue to have that um, Mexico and Canada is our number two, number one and two trading partners. This relationship with, with Mexico specifically has been on top of governor's priorities since the first day in office. In 2015, our first international trade mission trip was to Mexico City. And upon re-election in 2018, the first trip again was to Mexico City in December of that year for the presidential inauguration and also to have other, other meetings as we were meeting the incoming cabinet of, of the new president. So this relationship has been a, a, a pillar, like I said, and a key one to the state. Um, it, it makes obviously the financial numbers as, as we are, we topped over, and I have some um, data here, but over $22 billion in trade between our, our, our trade partners. So as we go on and see um, how we reopen and, and come back stronger, we're looking at our, our top customers, and in this case, uh, our Mexico and Canada. And with the Arizona Mexico Commission, this is a 61 year old organization that no other state in the country has something like the, what we call the AMC, Arizona Mexico Commission. Uh, it's been around, like I said, for 61 years. So it definitely uh, was here before us and it'll be here long after us. It's just been a matter of how Governor Ducey as the chair of the board of the Arizona Mexico Commission has been able to lead 
this part of, of the Arizona economy and, uh, and international presence. The Arizona-Mexico Commission has 16 binational committees, anything from mining to tourism to sports to the economy, um, and, and you name it. We, we have arts and culture, everything in between. And this allows us, by having private and public sector co-chairs from each side of the border, really partner and tackle projects like an infrastructure that has been a key component of this great relationship between specifically Sonora and Arizona in the last five years. Governor Pavlovich has been an amazing partner uh, to Governor Ducey and her team to us and state to state and business to business. The governor and our team have remained in contact. Um, our teams on daily basis with the health department in Sonora as we tackle this, no secret that uh, on the Sonora, Mexico side, they're about maybe three to four weeks a little behind of, of, of the numbers and, and the cases that we're seeing in the U.S. and specifically in Arizona. So we've, uh, we were able to go into a reopening phase a little before they have, and we've stayed in touch as we both tackle these issues together. And we agree that this brings a lot of really good opportunities in terms of regionalizing and shortening supply chain that we've seen in other countries that are more in the, you know, companies in China that are coming back here to the United States, but obviously we want to attract them to Arizona, but we have our partners in Sonora that as long as they choose this region, this region can really thrive and win and advance as we, uh, uh, as we approach USMCA uh, on July 1st and the kick-in of, of the new agreement and with the new interest of, again, shortening the supply chain and bringing these businesses back home. This, this poses a great opportunity for the partnership that we've been able to build over the last five years with these administrations, but really the last 61 years in terms of the Arizona Mexico Commission. So a lot of potential, very exciting times. Again, I'll wrap up by saying as we look at uh, how we uh, find our new normal and how we reopen and how we come back stronger and safer, it is absolutely essential to do this in lockstep with our friends in Sonora. Not only does our economy depend on it, but our tourism industry is also very dependent on this. Our food supply, as we um, tackle the issues and the challenges that, that the uh, ports of entry bring at this point, given the, the, the inspections and, and produce coming through and keeping our community safe, without this relationship in place, it would be a, a very hard task to tackle but we're very confident, the governor is very confident in his conversations directly with Governor Pavlovich. They've discussed this very issue and saying, how do we come back stronger and do it together? Which is, uh, which is I think, what, what we'll see and hear from Javier and others on the call today of how we can do this, but the relationship piece is going to be essential in this. So I'm, I'm happy to report from the governor's office side of things that the relationship is stronger than ever. It's, it's continued to get stronger in spite of all the pressures around. This is another challenge, the biggest one we face, but uh, we'll also have, I believe, and the governor believes, the, the biggest opportunities and victory after this as well. So thank you all for being on, and uh, um, you know, I'll turn it back over to you, Ken. Thank you very much, Juan. Thank you for your leadership and your collaboration. Thank you. I would now like to introduce Javier Hurtado, who is the director of the National Supplier Development Program for the Aerospace Industry in Mexico. That industry association is known as FEMIA. Javier will share his deep and broad knowledge of the aerospace, automotive, electrical, electronic, and other supply chains in Mexico. And he will identify for us the opportunities for Arizona companies that are immediately available. Thank you, Javier. Thanks a lot, Kevin, for the uh, invitation, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, uh, that there's definitely lots of business opportunities. Just as Juan was saying, the relationship is just about to get stronger. There's going to be more business opportunities for companies that have the right attitude, the right uh, business offer. Uh, lots of work packages are going to be coming back from uh, Far East for information. So, so uh, if we uh, start uh, working as a team, I believe there's going to be a lot of opportunities that we're going to be able to work on a binational level. So glad to be here. Thank you, Kevin. And let me 
start sharing my screen. So I wonder if you can see my screen right now. Yes, <laughs> yes we can. Okay. So we're going to be sharing the business opportunities uh, for, for Arizona industrial suppliers. Uh, just uh, very briefly, these are the five different industries we're uh, working with uh, right now. This is international airspace, obviously commercial, civil, uh, defense, in the automotive, light vehicles, and heavy duty, uh, not only for assembly manufacturing, but also for, for the, uh, I mean, not only for the OEMs, but also for the aftermarket. Energy, we're working different uh, verticals over here. Uh, solar, eolic, uh, oil and gas, e e even oil and gas right now is a, uh, down. That there's uh, some companies like ba Baker Hughes that are uh, continuing to uh, uh, enable contracts. So, so it's working. Uh, household appliances and medical devices. Um, and, and there's different uh, ways in which we can help. Three audiences that we work with, we work with buyers. We help them find, pre-audit, and develop suppliers. And as far as suppliers, we make easy the, the, the connection. We collaborate with, with uh, uh, governments and associations so that we make the, the, the right uh, business match. Um, getting, about, uh, getting into the COVID, obviously, and I'm showing a screen uh, about the shutdown of operations uh, of uh, different industries. This is uh, related to the automotive industry, but it happened to, to all of the industries. Obviously, we're in phase uh, three. There were lots of companies that uh, when we started the lockdown, that they were concerned uh, about if it was going uh, to be to the end of April. And they were very concerned because they said, if I need to still have my, my employees at home, to the end of April and pay them um, like their, their full wages, it's gonna be complicated. And, and not only did it go all the way to the end of April, but, but it's still, uh, we, we just had a meeting this morning where we are still discussing if uh, we're gonna be going back on May the 18th or it's gonna be pushed until June 1st. So, so we're just in that threshold right now to determine what's gonna happen. And obviously depending on the industry, there's going to be like three shapes of recovery. Uh, so, some could be the, like the, the L shape, which is the gray area over here, or, or the uh, V shape or the U shape. Uh, it's different recovery models. This is just an example, a graph, a chart that I found. And depending on the industry and, and on the vertical, even within the airspace, that there's going to be different recovery models. If we talk about rescue aircraft, it's different than if we talk about uh, commercial aircraft than if we talk about defense aircraft. So, so each one is going to have a, a different recovery uh, model, and we ought to pay attention to um, what, what are the areas that are recovering faster so, so that we can go along with them. An estimate uh, for, for some industries, uh, like for example, if we talk about airspace, we're expecting about an average of 40% decrease of the expectation that they had for this year and about 30% decrease of the expectation they had. And this would be for the upcoming three to five years. So it, it, it's a bit complicated depending on the vertical. However, there are some others like the defense sector that is going up. It, they, they have a ramp up. So, so this obviously triggers different uh, opportunities. And the key question over here is who will survive? After the lockdown, there's a lot of companies that might be shutting down. And this, sometimes the prejudice uh, allows us to say that this is gonna hurt small companies. Like the smaller companies have less resources. And I would say COVID is hitting us all. Uh, I've heard of uh, different tiers one. I cannot mention the names because of confidentiality, but um, very large companies, very global companies are having board meetings and they're considering shutting down for good. So, so spice doesn't matter over here. It can hit us all. And what we ought to do is to try to see what alternatives we, we can have, especially since there's a before and after. Uh, we will never go back to the way it used to be before. There's a new reality. That there's uh, different measures that we need to take. Even when we go back to work, 
right now you you, you can hear uh, two, two different um, perspectives. One saying that the economy should not be stopped, that everyone should go back to work. And the other one says uh, COVID is hitting us all, we should stay at home. And, and obviously we need to find a mix in between, but there's going to be this after because we're expecting COVID to, to stay. So if it's going to stay among us, we need to take measurements as to how we should go back to work, how, how we should uh, uh, protect our, our people. And, and then, then once again, there's going to bring a, a, a before and after relationship also between the connection of buyers and suppliers. Now, everything cannot be negative that there's different reactions from shop floors that had, were in the automotive sector, as we can see in the US and Canada. For example, Honeywell in Phoenix, that they started doing uh, N95 masks. And, and, and there's different operations that have turned their shop floors to, to essential sectors. Uh, some of them, like it was a reaction to COVID and it was a temporary reaction. There are some others that are thinking in, in, in um, diversifying their, their shop floors. And, and this is a very important thing. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. This is an Asian company. And the 2020 rule, which I suggest that we have, they said, I'm never going to let one industry to be more than 20% of my uh, sales. So, so that, that means that we ought to be at least in five industries so that if automotive goes down, I don't die with the automotive industry. If airspace goes down, I don't die with the airspace industry. So, so this is a very important rule. That's the first 20. In the second 20, they said within each industry, we're never going to let one single account, one single client to be more than 20% of my sales. So, so if we pursue that, that type of 2020 rule, this is going to be good for us. And right now, there's a lot of the diversification opportunities that we have. Now, what is the opportunity that we have? Lots of companies are going to be coming back from Asia. Uh, we, we had just a meeting with one buyer yesterday, and before COVID, uh, he was thinking on allocating um, 135 part numbers in this region. And, and yesterday in the meeting, he said, as of last week, this number goes up to 199 part numbers. And this number is just going to grow. So, so once again, this is a very good opportunity for us, if and only if, obviously, we get ready. Now, there's a lot of companies that are waiting for uh, everything to come back to normal, to, to all the uh, air shows or uh, different industrial shows to, to be back. And, and the question is, why wait? The, the sales cycle takes time. The alignment between the way the buyer works and the way suppliers sell, it takes time. If we introduce right now, a buyer and a supplier, the most likely thing to happen is that it'll take about a year for them to sign if they're ready. Be why? Because obviously we, we introduce them, they start bouncing emails back and forth, then they get access to an RFQ, they quote, they get feedback, they get audited and so on. And obviously it takes time. From, from point one where we introduce them to the point that they sign a contract, best case it's going to take 12 months. So, so if we introduce someone this summer, you're going to be signing a contract hopefully towards uh, the summer of uh, 2021. So, so don't wait, don't wait. Let's, let's move fast. Now, when we talk about different industries, obviously, and I'm showing three different maps, the landscape is different. Uh, uh, and with it, within each industry, even the landscape is different. Uh, I'm just going to give you one, one example. We, we had a company from Europe and, and they wanted to come to Mexico and they said, we are going to Querétaro because it's uh, where the airspace industry happens to be located at. And I said, it's five key regions, but, but depending on what you're looking for, it's going to be a different location. And they, they were after seat manufacturers. Seats manufacturers or interiors manufacturers happen to be in Chihuahua, in Nogales, Sonora, and in Tijuana, not in Querétaro. So, so that's why it is important to understand, okay, what industries am I pursuing? Where are they located? And, and, and uh, based on that, I can try to uh, see how to uh, put a business model. Now, wh why do we have business opportunities for uh, Arizona suppliers? If you see, this is the, the traditional supply chain uh, pyramid where we have in Mexico OEMs, tiers one, very little uh, tiers two, 
And the black, the, the, the blue part is where, where there's opportunities. The, the red pyramid in the bottom, that's a, a shape of how Mexico looks like. We have the OEMs, we have a tier one, but we don't have tier two, tier, tier three suppliers. Um, the applications, we, we can segregate the assembly of a full, uh, I'm gonna say a car or aircraft or, or sometimes an, um, a home appliance into these parts, interiors, engines, metal structures, the electrical system and sensors, uh, electronics and communications, braking systems, uh, water, waste and fuel systems, safety systems. So we, we ought to identify these eight areas and based on that, find them in Mexico and, and see what we ought to do. These five industries together uh, put together $5.1 uh, billion to be allocated uh, in, in procurement. Uh, are obviously segregated. Um, we, we have aggregated information because of NDAs that we have. Um, and, and if we want to discuss it on a one-to-one -one basis, we can disclose what type of metals, what type of plastics, what type of soft goods are being uh, looked for over here. But the, the opportunity is, uh, as of uh, last year, $4.1 billion in the five industries. And, and obviously, this is not the total. This is just the numbers that the buyers that are working with our programs have assigned to us to, to look for. As far as aerospace, this comes from uh, FEMIA and, and from FEMIA, basically it's different uh, purchasing pools that we have that we're seeing on the screen. Now, if we want to get together with one of these buyers, we ought to be prepared. And then this is where we say, success is where preparation and opportunity meet. Now, what do I mean by being prepared? If we want to have a very good B2B meeting, we have the three M's, which is the media, the way in which we get connected, the market, which ought to be the right buyer. By bond buyer, we mean someone who has a budget. The A stands for authority to make decisions to buy. The N means that they need what you sell and the T stands for time frame, and the message that the supplier conveys. Usually, if we are with the right buyer, we blame the, 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 the event, we blame the commercial mission and we say the commercial mission didn't work. And, and what we ought to question is what value proposition we're putting uh, for, for the buyer. And, and lessons learned, we, we had a contract with, with the Japanese government. We, we took um, two different trips to two different air shows and they were very happy because of the bit of meetings that we had and yet no business were signed, no contracts were signed. So, so the, the suppliers or, the, or value proposition for the buyers, we said, we'll connect you with bond buyers, with qualified buyers. And, and buyers said, the problem is you're not bringing qualified suppliers. And if they're disqualified, obviously it doesn't, it doesn't happen. So, so uh, this buyer said, we're going to train you to understand how to bring qualified suppliers. And this is what we're going to be sharing right now. Uh, I'm going to try to do it fast because of time. Number one, we ought to have a full company profile. What, what do buyers want to learn from you? They want to learn who you are, where you are, what you do, and how you do it. We'll, we'll get in deeper uh, details with this. And obviously how competitive you can be. And this is five layers that we will, will analyze today. These are the reasons why suppliers get rejected before coming to Mexico, before coming to a, a commercial mission or, or a B2B meeting. Number one, they don't have a clear value proposition in their presentation or website. The size of the company sometimes is not a good match. The size of the uh, machines that they have could be a, a, a mismatch. The raw materials that you have expertise with, the, the lack of certain certifications, low KPIs. And when this information is not present in a, a presentation, then we have rejection. Sometimes we say, it's because the buyer has favorite suppliers and it's not, it's not that way. Um, so, so there are ways in which uh, they get rejected. And, and I'm showing over here on the screen a view, and this is very important. This is a view of 60 suppliers. Each line that you see on this table is one supplier. You, there are eight factors that buyers want to learn, like the company profile, the human capital profile, your machinery and equipment, the first icon over here, it says company from, uh, and financial profile. This is the, the first major column over here. Four types of indicator. The green means the information's there. 
we're not judging the quality of the information. We're just saying, is there? Um, the, the yellow means the information is in plan or in process, like the certification, or the, the red means the information is not in the presentation or in the website. If you see these 60 suppliers, most of it is red. That means that the supplier doesn't have all the information that the buyer needs to, to, to engage with them. So what is this information? Obviously this information might help us. And these are different cases. Uh, obviously you're gonna have access. I'm not gonna go through this, uh, reading the whole presentation. The first one I'm gonna say, uh, the, the buyer needed a bracket supplier. We recommended 10 different suppliers. They started rejecting some of them. And I always ask, why do you reject them? And they say, because we already visited the website and they, they don't do what we need. And I said, we visited the shop floor, they do. So, so they, they got engaged because of this conversation. I called the, the owner of the company and I said, change your website. I mean, we, we cannot defend every conversation if your website is not present. And there's gonna be like 400 conversations you will not have and we will not be there to talk for you, to, to, to defend you. Uh, the, the other ones is um, we, we had a supplier and they spent a lot of time in the quotation process until they learned that, the, that there was a size constraint and they, they were not a good fit. So, so obviously uh, both the buyer and the supplier spent a lot of time because of this lack of information or the case of uh, the, the raw materials. So these are ways in which we can prevent or speed up the process of you getting connected. But that's if we have all the information. What you see on the screen right now is a who and where you are what you do and how you do it. First is the, com the company and financial profile, the international trade certifications that you have so, so that you can import and export easily and the human capital profile. Then is your capabilities. What industries and application you work with, products, size constraint, raw materials, if you have the engineering and design capability, what machines do you have, what RPMs and so on. Vertical integration, or if you, you are not vertically integrated, who you work with, Let's suppose they ask you for welding. Let's suppose they ask you for anodizing. Who do, do you do it with? And the innovation profile. And, and the how you do it is the quality uh, certification, KPIs, and commercial terms. These ought to be included in your presentation. As of today, as you saw in the previous chart, most of the companies do not have all of this criteria in their sales presentation. So obviously they get rejected even before coming to Mexico. Now, what happens after the meeting? Usually the complaint that a lot of buyers have about North America is we're very slow to respond. Uh, signing the NDA, it takes a lot of time and quotation. We, we had, for example, a supplier day. Uh, this was 25 suppliers that were invited, $250,000 million to be allocated. And, and three weeks later, the buyer says, I have no quotations. What happened to, to these suppliers? And these suppliers, the mix was about 50% US suppliers, 50% uh, suppliers in Mexico. And the, the, he said, I'm gonna tell you what you are competing against with. He said, if I would have launched this RFQ in Turkey or in South Korea, in less than 48 hours, I would have gotten the, the quotation. And two weeks later, I would already have prototypes in my desk. So, so they said, that's what you're competing in as far as time. As far as cost, uh, obviously we're very, being very expensive. And, and by being very expensive, sometimes we see quotations that are about six times more expensive than what they're currently paying. So, so this is why they get rejected in, in, in a lot of cases. Uh, I'm not gonna read through all of this, but this is ways in which uh, they get rejected afterwards. Number one, they're slow to sign, as I said before, expensive quotations. There's a lot of suppliers that do not know how to quote. Uh, one uh, buyer, for example, last year, they touched base with 120 suppliers. We referred about 80 some of them. And towards the end of the year, we made an analysis of those uh, 120 suppliers. And I asked the buyer, how were they? And then they said, the average supplier quoted three times more expensive than, than what I'm currently paying. And I said, I'm sure that the profile of the companies is not bad. They just didn't know how to quote. So give us an opportunity to develop some of the suppliers that you liked. So, so he, he assigned one supplier, for example, this is the, the case over here. 
some of the part numbers that were quoted uh, at 8% the shoot cost. So it was very competitive, but some others were 1600%. If this buyer would have hired this supplier, it would have been a loss of $3.5 million per year. So he said, I'm not gonna lose money. So, so they, they uh, uh, asked us to intervene this uh, supplier. We made a value stream costing analysis and we eradicated a lot of uh, uh, mistakes that they had in the presentation. And, and this allowed us uh, to, to help the supplier quote again. This quotation the second time was 60% more competitive. So uh, once again, these are ways in which they're being rejected. And this is way beyond the B2B meeting. So, so all of these are cases, you're gonna have access to, to all of this information so, so that you can review it. Now, if, if you could have perhaps a, a very important slide, I, I would believe this would be the most important slide or one of the most important slides in the presentation. Why, why do suppliers fail? Like e even if you pre present everything, when you quote, I, I suggest you pay attention to these five items. Number one, what is the uh, costing model that you're using? Is it a, a single model or a, an ABC costing model? How fast can you quote? And, and remember, uh, in, in Asia or in Turkey, they're quoting in less than 48 hours. That means they're doing some homework that perhaps we're not doing. Uh, open book quotation in these 12 elements. And, and why is this important? If we open books, uh, a lot of suppliers say they're gonna know how much I'm making. This is your profits. But what happens if you're buying expensive raw materials? That's when we can help. What happens if your cycle times is, uh, uh, I don't know, six to 10 times more uh, than the cycle time of the shoot cost? That's where we can help. What happens if the, over, if the overhead costs are not the right ones? I mean, this is a way in which we can find how to develop the supplier. The commercial terms you're putting on board, usually when we work with a tier one, they're gonna be trying to pay from 120 days to 180 days. It, it, the average supplier says, I can offer credit terms of 30 to 45 days. So, so if we are not ready, we, we, we might get disengaged. And then how we, did we get to, to these numbers? Was it a firm quotation based on that uh, specific part number? Did I use historic numbers or did I estimate? And, and, and finally, how competitive am I versus the guy in Turkey on a total landed cost perspective. What is a total landed cost perspective? Once I deliver the product at my client's door. So, so sometimes the guy in Turkey, if I can be more competitive than them on a total landed cost perspective, that's when I can win. If I cannot win, question, where do I press? What, which button do I press to, to, to make it better? And these are the five layers that they, they want to, to know. How fast can you quote? How competitive are you? Will you open the quotation? Will you sign terms and conditions fast? About the process, will it be the first time, right? That means zero defects, because otherwise I'm gonna be paying for it. What are your lead times and can you deliver on time every time? Do you need a value stream costing? This is if and only if you're not quoting competitively. And how do you know if you're quoting competitively if you don't have any feedback? That's easy. Review out of the last 10 RFQs that you got, how many did you win? If you won eight out of 10, I, I believe you're good. But if you won, I don't know, one, two, perhaps three out of 10, we ought to review what's wrong. And, and, and there's, there's room for, for improvement. And when we said there's a lot of opportunities coming back from Asia, we cannot keep on quoting the way it used to be before they went to Asia. So, so we need to be more competitive and that doesn't mean that you need to, to make less money. That means that we need to be more competitive. So, so these are ways in which we can try to, to, to flip the, 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 the game. Um, with, with these things that we've done, good thing is that in the 2017, 2019 period, we were able to truly connect 23 suppliers who signed contracts. It was a little over 1,500 part numbers, $37 million. Um, we, we, didn't stop there. We, we obviously this was a lot of development that we did, but right now we are still working. We are putting together a hundred supplier development plans. Uh, actually, it's a little bit more than that. Uh, Fifteen costing and pricing models. These are the guys that are expensive and that we are putting a, a, a someone in their shop floor 
to understand how they're coming with the pricing. And we are also connecting uh, financial institutions. Uh, I'm gonna mention one example. This was um, a, a supplier and they're potentially being awarded a contract. The lead time of the raw materials, it takes six months. They need to pay 50% upfront, wait for six months and then pay the, the other 50%. Then it takes three weeks for them to receive the raw materials. And then it'll take them three months to, to process what they need to do, then deliver, and then wait for 120 days to get paid by the tier one. If you see it's a long shot to, to, to finance that operation, and that's where we are bringing in very competitive international uh, financial institutions so that we can help those, those suppliers. And, and these are things we are working with. The, the forecast that we're seeing is that we're gonna be connecting more than 40 suppliers, more than 4,000 part numbers this year, and this number is gonna to grow to $100 million. Now, this number might be a very good number, and if we see it isolated, it's a very, very good number. It's, it's a score, it's a good score. But if you see $100 million versus the $4.1 billion that were to be allocated, there's a lot of room to do business that there's nothing that we've done uh, compared to the size of the opportunity. So, so that means uh, that there's a lot of opportunity for all those companies of you uh, on the table. Now, not all regions are the same in Mexico and there are different factors that are going to impact the cost. And this is very important. Know before you try to approach the buyer, do your numbers and, and we can help you uh, try to run a cost model. Sometimes they're gonna ask you about logistics. How will you del deliver? And if we go to central Mexico, it's gonna be a different story than if we go to Monterey, than if we go to Sonora. So, so we need to understand the game before, before we do it. So how, how do we check this? Uh, we need to integrate a Mexico project profile. And this would be your company has to have very clear reasons as to why you want to connect with this buyer in Mexico. What is your current stage with numbers? And by current stage, I mean uh, have you already uh, established business connections with Mexico? If, if it's going to be your first time, it's a different stage than if it's going to be the, your third client in Mexico. Uh, what industries, applications, and supply chains you're going to be pursuing in your place in the supply chain? It, it, it's very different saying that you will uh, serve a, a tier one than saying you, you want to uh, serve a tier three. And, and then what's your value proposition? This means all the elements that we uh, were talking about before. What type of uh, uh, capabilities are you gonna be putting on board? What type of commercial terms? What type of business plan stages you plan to do? And the rest would be, let's get connected. Uh, let, let's review this. These are the industries, the applications. These are different industries and the name of um, OEMs that have a footprint in Mexico. So first, first thing would be identify the industry, identify the application and the type of uh, supply chain you would be willing to follow. And then you're placing the supply chain. We have five different levels. In the above the line, uh, above the yellow line, we have the direct part uh, suppliers, uh, which would be this manufacturing processes, which is what we need the most or processes that are applied to direct parts. If we, fall, if we fall below the yellow line, these are the indirect suppliers. Number one happen to be the, the ones that touch the production line. Number two, the delivery um, uh, product uh, or, or services. And number three, everything that is totally indirect. So for us, it'd be very important to understand industry, application, and then what level are you in so that we can determine who the buyer is and where they happen to be located at. Most of the indirect suppliers, I mean, of the indirect buyers happen to be in Mexico. Most of the direct buyers happen to be in the US. So let's suppose we want to visit a buyer that is in Chihuahua where Tania is, or, or, or perhaps the Guanajuato region, and perhaps we are a, a tier two supplier most likely thing to happen is that the decision making will happen outside of Mexico. Whereas if we go on the tooling side, the decision will be made in Mexico. So, so 
this is very important to determine before we even go to Mexico. So just to be close in this, how do we put together a plan for Mexico? There are 10 key steps that I suggest you take. The first one are on the strategy side, uh, who your, uh, I, your ideal client would be, and this will help you determine even the location where, where we'll, be help you, uh, we'll be helping you to connect the right, right buyer. The value proposition that you have, which is your full profile that we already discussed. Um, your sales objectives, if they ask you for key questions, what is the number that you're pursuing uh, in, in, in Mexico? There's an example that I always like to give. This was a Chinese guy and, and he was brought by one buyer and, and at the initial point of the conversation, he said for less than $6 million a year, there's no deal. I'd be interested in signing a deal for at least $6 million. So, so obviously this turned the conversation into a different direction. So what are your numbers? What are your sales objectives for Mexico? What is your main go-to-market strategy? How will you get connected with this buyer? And then the commercial process. What are the stages you will need to follow? Based on this commercial process, what tools will you require? And remember, if we connect you with a buyer, they're going to be expecting you for you to sign the NDA really fast. And by really fast, I mean less than 24 hours. They would be expecting you to quote in less than 48 hours, top a week. So, so if, if we were given a quotation, an RFQ, how fast can we review drawings and so on? Or what inputs do we need from the buyer so that we can quote fast? These are the tools that we need. What is, what's the key information that we require for each tool? Who's going to do what, when, and how much will it cost you? So this is putting your, your plan for Mexico. Then the rest would be get together with uh, the, the Arizona team and, and, and perhaps with ourselves to determine and review your, your plan, to review the cost model simulation and, and, and then your readiness to get connected. And readiness goes into the marketing and sales side, the commercial side, and their technical readiness as well. Um, from this point on, we can determine what are the gaps that we have and the rest would be, let's get you connected, let's get you uh, promoted. There, there's different buyers that said, uh, since you don't have a conflict of interest, uh, give me the, the direct contacts of the uh, supplier. And that's what we do. We put together databases, we put together inventories. And whenever they ask us for machining suppliers, we say, these are the companies that we have. Whenever they, they say, well, let's narrow it down. Let's say, I need machining suppliers of uh, more than 100 inches that can work with Inconel that have a, a AS9100 certification. That's things that we have in the inventory. So that's why it is very important to, to be in the inventory and then get some uh, sort of assistance, perhaps with uh, the Arizona uh, team or, or with our, ourselves to get connected uh, over here. Um, we have prepared different guides because there's uh, obviously lots of different questions and they're gonna be published in this, in this uh, site industrialbusinessmexico.com where you can be downloading uh, uh, different guides to prepare your, your value proposition. So I wonder if there's any uh, questions or, or comments uh, that we, we have the, 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 the Q&A uh, session. I wonder if we could open it so, so that we uh, review if there's uh, questions or comments of uh, what we presented so far. Um, Javier? Um, yep. we have, we'll have a Q and a session, um, that'll come in about, uh, about seven minutes. Okay. Um, good. And people, people can use the, um, the chat icon at the bottom of your screen to, uh, to submit a question. Very, very good. Thanks very much, Javier. Well, th thanks to you, Kevin. I hope this was a, a good value for the audience over here today. Very, very concrete and insightful. Thank you. Um, I would like to take you through a couple of programs that we have uh, that will um, assist you as you pursue the opportunities that, um, that Javier has covered. Um, these are resources and programs available to Arizona companies. Um, I'll quickly go through those um, and then we can um, uh, introduce you to our teams in Mexico and also um, open this up for, um, for Q&A. Um, we have we have three trade offices in, in Mexico. Those are located in Mexico City, in Chihuahua, and Guanajuato. Um, what, do, what do those offices and what do the teams in those offices do for you? They will, they will do market research for you. Does your company have a, uh, 
uh, a market in, in, in Mexico? Um, do you have a competitive advantage? The various things that Javier was talking about. Um, our teams will also um, help you find sales channel partners. Um, it could be a distributor, it could be a rep, could be uh, that you sell direct to end buyers and users, maybe you're selling to the government. They can help you with those introductions. Um, the team also does in-country in Mexico B2B, B2B matchmaking um, for companies that go in individually into the market. Um, they also assist us um, when we bring delegations to trade shows and expos into Mexico. Those delegations are companies like yours who are looking for sales channel partners and for end buyers and end users. And they also provide assistance on um, uh, trade missions that we lead. And these are trade missions that are, that are very much um, lean and um, uh, lean and crisp. Uh, these are, trade missions where each company goes into market with us with a pre-vetted, pre-scheduled set of meetings unique to that company and that company's product or service. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to introduce you to our trade teams um, and um, uh, hopefully each of them can, um, can say hello um, and introduce themselves. Um, Nat Natalia. Hello, how are you? Uh, I'm Natalia Perez. I lead the Arizona Mexico City uh, Trade and Investment Office for Arizona. And well, we're here to, to help Arizona companies to do business in Mexico. So uh, don't hesitate to contact us. Mauricio. Hi, hi everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction, and uh, uh, I'll be available for any, any company that could um, need help here in the Guanajuato region in the center of Mexico. I'll be more than happy to help. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm in charge of the Chihuahua Arizona Trade and Investment Office. I'm looking forward to start working with all of you. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, my name is Monica. I'm the operations director at the Arizona Mexico City Trade Investment Office. Um, and well, we are very, very glad to, to have you with us and we'll be glad to help you in anything you, you would like to come to Mexico. Hi, this is Paola. Also glad you are all here and hoping to work with you in the future. And Anything you need here in Mexico, let us know. Thank you. Um, before I get to the STEP program, let me just mention that the, um, the services that I went through that are provided by our trade teams in Mexico are free of charge. They're free of charge to you as Arizona companies. Um, and, and how does one engage um, one of our teams? Um, you should reach out to me directly um, via email would be fine. I send you a simple two page request for assistance form that enables you to uh, put down in writing um, some information about your company above and beyond what one might find on your website, um, what you are trying to uh, accomplish in Mexico. Um, and then I share that with our teams in Mexico. We arrange a conference call um, before they mobilize on your behalf. The second program I wanna talk about in addition to our trade office program is a program that's exclusively for small businesses. There's no size requirement to use our Mexico trade offices. You can be a small company, a medium company, a large company. The Arizona STEP program is a small business program. Frankly, most of the companies on this call are probably eligible as a small business. That's the uh, SBA's definition of a small business, which employment count is, um, is the 500 number. Um, this is a program that provides technical and financial assistance for small businesses to pursue export markets, including Mexico, um, but not exclusive to Mexico. Um, four components to this trade program. Number one, provides financial assistance for you to, uh, to go on trade missions with us, for us to organize missions, to organize meetings for you, um, and it helps us provide um, some financial assistance for your travel costs. 
Um, the program also enables us to take you to uh, uh, trade expos and trade shows around the world, including in Mexico. Um, if you're in the STEP program, you have no space, booth space cost or booth furnishing cost, and we're able to provide you with some financial assistance for your travel costs. Um, the program also provides some financial assistance um, for um, U.S. commercial export assistance services. And fourth, um, if you're a company that wants to translate or localize some of your website into um, other than English content, um, we can provide you with some financial assistance um, to do that kind of translation. Again, if you're interested in the STEP program, um, please contact me. There's no enrollment fee. Uh, it's not a competitive um, application process. It's, uh, it's an open enrollment program, and um, we actually have two uh, overlapping STEP programs right now that are active. I want to go through uh, some of the trade shows that we're going to be doing in Mexico. I mentioned, uh, I mentioned the financial support that uh, is available to companies via the STEP program to participate in trade shows. This will give you an idea of the kinds of trade shows that we will be going to and bringing groups of Arizona companies who will um, uh, exhibit collectively in an Arizona booth pavilion. In the aerospace sector, we'll be doing two shows in Querétaro, Mexico. One is in October of 2020, um, and then the other one is in uh, April of 2021. The next sector is the mining sector. Uh, we, we historically do one to two mining expos in Mexico every year. We also tend to do at least one or two uh, aerospace expos in Mexico. We have a, um, a mining expo in Hermosillo uh, in October and um, the mining expo in Chihuahua in uh, next spring. Uh, we'll be bringing a group to the Medical Expo um, in Mexico City in October of this year. And um, in the, in where, where, um, where Mauricio was located in Guanajuato, we'll be bringing a group of um, Arizona companies to um, an agricultural technology show. Um, that's in November of 2020. In um, October of 2020, um, we'll be bringing a group of consumer product companies to um, one of the largest Latin American consumer product shows that's in Guadalajara. Um, for companies in the security and defense space, um, we're bringing a group to uh, Expo Seguridad in Mexico City in August of 2020. And uh, finally, um, we'll be doing the uh, second edition of, um, of Industrial Transformation, which is essentially an advanced manufacturing uh, trade expo. We uh, participated as a state in the first edition last year. That's going to be in October of 2020. If you're interested in participating in these shows with us, uh, please do not hesitate to, to send me an email at my email address there below. The final, the final program that um, I want to tell you about before we move to the Q&A is a program called Export Tech. Export Tech is a, essentially an export boot camp. And um, companies go through this program, six to a half a dozen companies at a time. There are no competitors within a cohort. Um, simplistically, on day one and on day 30, you're in a classroom for two-thirds of the day um, uh, learning uh, learning from various export experts, a wide variety of subject matter topics that are, that are um, uh, very, very important for you as you, um, as, you, as you either export for the first time or um, as you export it into new markets. You graduate on day 60 with an export plan that you've developed along with an export coach that's been assigned to you and that works within the constraints of your schedule. Um, you, you graduate with an export plan specific to your company's product and service. Um, you also graduate with um, go-to-market financial assistance to undertake export initiatives that you identify in your export plan. And that go-to-market assistant is enabled by a bridge that we've created between our STEP program and the export tech program. We deliver 
typically two export tech programs on an annual basis. Again, if you're interested in that program, uh, feel free to, um, to send me an email. This takes us now to the Q&A session and I see, that, um, I see that questions have come in via chat. Um, I'll turn this over to uh, our colleague, Tanya, who is in our Chihuahua office to, uh, to moderate this section. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Kevin. So we've been having some questions that has been already answered. And we do have one now that, um, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having technical issues like the windows is popping up. Um, can somebody from the team, the team tell me read this question, please? It's something related to the USMCA from John. Hello, can you hear me? I can, I can help you, Tanya. So you, Tanya. Uh, we, we have uh, John Rimmer saying, uh, will the USMCA eliminate the unfair practice of Mexico insisting that the electrical products to have NOM that are the Mexican standards. The lighting fixtures I'm talking about are all USA made, UL and CSA Canada listed. These fixtures must be NOM certified and tested in Mexico every year. This is impossible to ask an American manufacturer to say certify every year. Will UL and CSA, once you are certified, it is forever on a particular product? I don't know, Javier, if you have any- Javier, do you have a response to that? I think it'd be good perhaps to take it on a one-to-one -one basis, especially talk to uh, a foreign trade uh, company. Uh, we have a national committee uh, that, that's uh, negotiating and renegotiating re uh, constantly on, on very specific items on, on the uh, new uh, US trade, US, um, See, uh, um, trade. So, um, wh why don't we take it on, on a one to one basis and we organize a? Uh, I, I can bring together some of the guys that are in that negotiation uh, table so that they can give us the specifics because uh, things are being negotiated on, on a very detailed level. So, so, if we take it on a one to one basis, we can have this discussion. So should I coordinate with you, Natalia, and, and, and we could... Uh... That's fine. Yes, uh, I will also put a, a comment here as an answer. You can also uh, contact any one of the offices through Kevin. Uh, we are just uh, doing something like this for, uh, for an Arizona company about the norms. So don't hesitate to contact us. Yeah, especially last week we had a meeting uh, regarding some, some uh, items with some of these companies. And, and things are not written in stone yet. So, so things are changing. That's why we ought to have it on a one-to-one -one basis and see what, what updates uh, we're having. Okay, we have another question from Fernando Sandoval that it's in the chat. Uh, he commented, either during the preparation phase or once a deal is in the works with a potential client for the AC exporting company, do you find it necessary to partner with a local AC import export logistics company? For me, the answer is yes. Uh, I believe the best example that I can give you is, um, I, I believe it's uh, with uh, Union Pacific, for example, uh, when there was the bottleneck uh, of uh, importing things from Asia to the, the East Coast, I'm gonna say, they had a very interesting value proposition in which they said, you can make a line to, to offload a, a ship in Long Beach or go all the way to Panama and it's going to be still uh, slow or you can come to us and in, in, within 48 hours we can have your cargo in, in any destination, Chicago, New York, you name it. What they did is through railroad, they, they would take everything all the way to New Mexico where they had their, their multi-model 
and, and they would uh, ship it. Uh, and, and their value proposition was 48 hour uh, lead time. One of the main problems that we're having in, in a lot of industries is logistics. So if we start working as a team by saying, let's consolidate cargoes and let's make it more efficient, that then I think it, it could work. And, and we shouldn't wait until the supplier is trying to quote. We could try to uh, plot different alternatives. Let's suppose, for example, with the different regions you're representing, let's suppose uh, Tania arranges a meeting with one of the buyers in Chihuahua and if you want to cater something or deliver a value proposition, I think it'd be good to say, these are the manufacturing capabilities that we could put together and this is the way that we will deliver. So, so if we prepare all of that ahead of time, I think it'd be very good. So, so, so don't wait. Yes, it, it, it'd be necessary to partner with a, uh, an import export logistics company from day one. Great, thank you. Um, we have uh, uh, Darman Richardson. Uh, is there a good resource to understand the regulatory status of manufacturing in border cities such as Nogales? We have several customers with locations that were shut down by local and Mexican authorities because they were not deemed essential to Mexico. Um, as, as far as this, for example, um, we're about to be back, the, depending on the on, on this, this sector. Just this morning and yesterday, obviously we're in a different discussion groups and we, we are still discussing whether the rest of the industry should get back on the 18th or on June the 1st. This is about to, to, to happen. So I, I don't know what, what uh, type of uh, companies you're trying to get connected with, but, but the most likely thing to happen I'm going to give you the example of uh, meetings that we had with the federal government last week. And this was with all the industrial sectors. They said, we want uh, the, the national associations like INDEX, like FEMIA, like the INA, which is for automotive. That we we uh, already integrated a national protocol to get back to work. And once we integrated uh, the, the, the full protocol, we are going to be like the, the auditing part. So, so the federal government said, FEMIA and INA, ma make sure you uh, distribute this protocol and that you make sure that all the operations follow the protocol to get back. A and if that ha happens, we will have very few inspectors that go and check uh, uh, on a random basis, those operations. And if they're following the protocol, everyone should get back really soon. So, so I would say that that the, the, we would be waiting, I don't know, two to three more weeks for everything to go back, unless something happens, of, of course. But, but um, that, that's the expectation that we have. So if we use industry time, uh, waiting two to three more weeks, I don't think is gonna hurt us. I, I think this is fast time. Now, if, if you wanna touch base on a one-to-one on -to -one basis, we've been helping very specific companies and trying to justify why they should turn into essential. To give you one example, I talked to one of the medical device buyers and I said, I wanna help you and I want you to help me. And he said, how do you wanna help me? And I said, I need to, I, I know that you have work packages that could be allocated in Mexico or any side of the border. And, and I, I can help you with the companies that we've already uh, touched base. And, and he said, and how do you want my assistance? And I said, you are on the medical device field. So if I turn one of the, let's say sheet metal suppliers to start manufacturing goods for you, they could turn into an essential company. They said, good, let's do it. Uh, and, and just that, in that call, he awarded me um, $80 million to be allocated in plastic injection molding. He said, find me suppliers on both sides of the border. And just as this, he is gonna be sending us more uh, uh, procurement opportunities so if we have to wait because these companies are non-essential, perhaps we could touch base on a one-to-one -one basis to see how we can connect them to an essential buyers and sponsor them, if that could be the case. But other than that, we should be waiting two to three more weeks for everyone to, to get back to, to operations. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any more questions right now. I don't know if uh, someone has any any other questions for any of the of the panelists. Natalia, I think you might have gotten a few questions via WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp. Okay. Uh, no, from you. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, how key or it is not key that I speak Spanish? I don't think it'd be complicated unless you want to sell to local suppliers. But uh, usually, especially along the border states, um, everyone speaks English in the manufacturing operations, obviously. I mean, if you want to go to to a grocery store locally, obviously it's going to be complicated. You, you need to speak Spanish. If you want to talk to, to the local policeman on the street, obviously you need to speak Spanish. But, but talking about the manufacturing industry, in most places in Mexico, they speak English. So I don't, I don't, see, I don't see a problem. Great, thank you. Uh, how important is it that I... I commit to going to Mexico multiple times to do a deal. I think that's a complicated question. I think that has to do, let me put it this way. The best case would be in which we have a buyer with an urgent need and we have a supplier with the right level of response and readiness and they engage really fast. And what is really fast? I, I just connected two suppliers in less than two weeks. And, and it happened, most of it on the phone. Uh, the, they bounced information and obviously the, the, the buyer said, do you know them? And you said, yes, we've already even audited the, the, the supplier. So this happened really fast. Uh, and then the, there's the other case in which it could go all the way to 18 months and coming back and forth, but perhaps, um, what, what I would uh, think that the, the only time most important to come would be if you're gonna see part numbers in Mexico. So for example, uh, in February, last February, we hosted a, a, a FEMIA meeting in uh, Chihuahua and we integrated a plant tour. And this was because of an agreement that we're having with some buyers. Uh, obviously, put yourself in the place of the buyer. They want to launch RFQs that will bring the most benefit to their companies as far as savings and, and, and short lead times. So that, that doesn't mean that they don't buy what you sell. That means that it's not their priority. And sometimes you connect with them and then they say, oh, I'll call you when I need you. And they, they do need you, but it's not their priority and they don't call you. And then you, you say, oh, it's not important. So what we're doing for those cases <clears throat> we're visiting shop floors and we're saying I'm gonna give you a plant tour so that you see everything that they do so that you can talk to the people on the production line and, and, and see how you can quote something differently and once you have a proposition we upload it to the buyer so, so that, that that's important for you to visit the, the shop floor so that you learn and, and ask specific questions and see drawings and see part numbers and so on but other than that, I think one of the big lessons learned that we have from COVID is we don't need to travel that much. We're, we're having a lot of meetings. So, so if we get prepared, like if, if you want to get specific guides as, as to what are the specific uh, guidelines for information that buyers will require and you do your homework, we bounce it back with buyers and it's going to be really fast. Perhaps you don't even need to travel to get an RFQ. So, so I, I think COVID is going to be teaching us a lot that we will not require to travel a lot unless we need to see drawings or the problem in the production line or so, or so on. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of uh, trips back and forth. Thank you, Javier. I think in our experience, um, what you said about preparation, having the, good info the right information of the company, the right information on the product, your processes, uh, that will help to reduce uh, the number of time that you will have to come and see the, uh, the person in a, 
in Mexico. So I, I think that that's a very important part that we also as Mexico City offices learn now how to help companies to better prepare prior to a trip, prior to connecting with a, a new market. I think we're, I think we're at a close of our time period here for the webinar, and I want to thank uh, I want to thank Juan and Javier for participating, um, and I want to thank all of the attendees. I hope you found this to be a uh, useful uh, webinar, and I hope that you will engage us and our Mexico teams. And we look forward to being of assistance to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. Thank you all. Thank Thanks, you. Javier. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Nice to see you again. All right. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.